Great. Well, thank you, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. I actually uh, met Sandy and the Siegel team a little bit over two years ago. Uh, we were doing research in the lab and we're seeing very promising results on demyelinating diseases. In fact, so much so that the FDA granted us, they reviewed our data and gave us um, orphan drug status and optic neuritis and ADM. But our question was, can you tell us more about the patients? You know, as we think about this, what are their lives like and the like? And so that kind of invoked into a, a uh, thought partnership. And then I guess a couple months ago, they asked, well, could you come and kind of tell us what you've been up to? And it's actually pretty exciting. And I enjoy being here, getting to kind of see the end product of kind of the results of our research and really learning from you guys, you know, as we go forward. First off, a little bit of a disclosure. I do spend a lot of time at Trothera uh, working on this project. I now will go ahead and tell you what we're up to in terms of the current state. Why does an emergency room physician run a biotech and um, in invent a, go forward with a drug, you know, to treat patients? Well, we've had some really good um, developments lately. First off, we dose the first patient in medical history with this drug, a DCK inhibitor, in a cancer trial. We're currently running a dose escalation trial for patients with solid tumors. Secondly, it's been incredibly well tolerated. This is a once-a-day pill uh, that patients uh, take by mouth, and so far we've not seen any dose-limiting toxicities. We're about two dozen patients in at this point. Lastly, or I guess thirdly, we have um, been able to do quite a bit of research in the lab, working with mice, and we're able to be designated an orphan drug by the FDA for two of the diseases that we're looking at this weekend at the conference, ADM and optic neuritis. Also, in the last 24 months, uh, we've been awarded over $7 million in grant monies uh, from the NIH after scientific review, of which over half of that have been in these demyelinating disease spaces. And then lastly, very close to home, we will be filing a pre-IND package with the FDA this year, uh, we're about 100 pages in already, uh, to be entering an ADM phase one trial and be able to cross-reference our existing clinical data. This is really important. We already have a clinical safety and data package, you know, already with the FDA with our solid tumors patients that we're dosing, that we're dosing currently. Now, I like to say that who you're working with is 10 times more important than what you're working on, and we've really established a, a nifty uh, team, a superb team of uh, scientists and uh, physicians that are helping to uh, make this go forward. Some of these have been part of the um, of this uh, conference, you know, throughout the years. The other thing is our second team is that uh, we've been funded to date uh, by a very tight-knit, close group of uh, grateful patients uh, who've been able to kind of cheer us on, you know, with uh, each step of the way. So if that's the team, let's talk a little bit about the science. In order for cells to divide, they have to have two sets of DNA, and they can do that through one or two pathways. There's the de novo pathway that's there on the top, and then there's the salvage pathway that's there on the bottom. Now, the de novo pathway takes the things that we eat and then makes these DNA building blocks by scratch. That's why it's actually called de novo, right, from scratch. And then the cell has two sets of, of DNA and can divide. You may be familiar with some of the drugs that work in this pathway. Both Abagio and Mavenclad are FDA approved for multiple sclerosis. Now there in the bottom of the slide in orange is the salvage pathway. Rather than making these DNA building blocks called nucleotides from scratch, uh, they make them by exactly what the name says, recycling or salvaging little bits of DNA that are circulating outside of the cell they bring them in and then are able to make all four of those DNA building blocks. Our drug, Tray 515, works on DCK. This is the pathway, the salvage pathway is what we are, what we are targeting, and this has never been done before. This is a first in pathway, first in class uh, drug that we've developed uh, with a close collaboration, of course, with UCLA and other universities. The pathway is important probably for two reasons. One is that it's upregulated in whenever cells divide abnormally and rapidly, like in autoimmune diseases, they favor the salvage pathway because it's a shortcut, 
right? Everything's already done. You just have one little step. It take, it's much faster. It takes less energy. The second part is DCK blocks all four of those DNA building block precursors. So it's kind of like the rate limiting step, you know, in the process. Well, let's go a little bit more. Where we are today was actually quite a story in the making. In fact, when I was in, when I graduated medical school in the previous century, which seems a long time ago, <laughs> uh, we all knew DCK in terms of its identity and its function. But it was really in 2009 where scientists at UCLA started looking at DCK as a potential drug target. And they started finding a few things. You know, one was if you inactivate DCK, there's these immune cells, T cells and B cells, that, you know, they seem to be impacted. And so the next thing they found is, well, if you do it while they're dividing, it creates replication stress. So that could potentially treat diseases of abnormal cell division. And very interestingly, when they knocked out DCK genetically, so when mice were born with no DCK, no gene, they lived normal, healthy lives. So that's, that kind of puts you on the trail of drug development. In 2014, they started thinking, well, what about T cell cancers? Could we look at something like that in the mice and the like? And then things really started to develop. They took over, over 1,000 different compounds and screened them. They found that uh, TRAY515 seemed to be the optimal, uh, the optimal structure. We have developed some biomarkers that are very important. We'll talk about those a little bit more, both the PET probe and a liquid biomarker uh, that we can measure with both patients, we're doing it now, and also with mice. And then we formed a, we formed a company, actually I wasn't there, I came a little later, and, uh, and we also did the NeuroPilot study. And it was really at the end of 2021 that things got interesting. We got the orphan drug designation uh, for optic neuritis and ADM, and we dosed our, we did a first in human dosing, uh, dosing a patient with a solid tumors. And this is really our story, is we think the salvage pathway plays a real major role in that rapid abnormal cell division, which you can find in autoimmune disorders as well as cancers. So let's see what that looks like. This is a mouse model of demyelinating disease. Actually, Kyle talked about it yesterday in his presentation. But this is, um, this is like a MOG challenge that induces demyelination in the mice. And you can see if I can be as successful here. There we go. These mice, they're having seizures, right? They can barely move. There's a lot of, um, you know, they're very skinny. The one on the bottom uh, left, you know, has one working paw. He's kind of able to pull himself barely across the stage, barely across the cage. Here is the same study. Uh, mice on our drug. Wow. Healthy, doing what mice do, climbing up the cages, all these sorts of things. If you want, you can take a picture of the QR code and show this at football games or cocktail parties, <laughs> whatever you like. But um, this is the data that we took to the FDA, and then we went ahead and then replicated the data at two independent labs, plus again at UCLA. So how we got to that is I think really important. And we sort of played the role of a private detective. It was a mystery to solve. And the first thing you have to do is ask yourself, well, where are we going to see high levels of DCK? And so I mentioned we have this PET probe where we can measure on a cellular basis where DCK is. And you see there on the slide, this is a, um, this is a uh, MOG mouse model of um, a normal mouse and then one that's been induced with demyelinating disease. And with a PET probe, the brighter colors mean higher activity. And so you can see that when mice you know, go, go into uh, the states of MS, optic neuritis, and ADM, there's a whole, whole bunch of activity. So that put us on the trail. And you know, our PET probe is almost like, uh, it's very specific. It's almost like having fingerprints. But if you're going to be a good detective, the next question, of course, well, okay, if DCK is there, you know, can we block it? And the answer is an emphatic yes. So this is a mouse with demyelinating disease um, that it's a pet pro, it's a PET scan. So it's a and it's you're looking kind of at a cross section of the of the of the belly of the mouse, and the red spot is the spleen, 
where immune cells kind of go to grow and develop, you know, when you have an autoimmune disease. And you see the red there, you know, without drug on board, you know, the, the unfortunately your own army, your immune cells are, you know, getting activated and going out and attacking your neurons. Once we give the drug, as you see it on the right, the red's gone away, the DCK activity has decreased. And we did the same thing, I mentioned we are treating um, tumors, we did the same thing with mice with tumors. Uh, this is a cancer, uh, a, a tumor cells that have been planted in the shoulder of a mouse. You see that there's no drug on board, you know, the DCK is activated because the, um, the cancer cells are using the salvage pathway to short circuit and grow quickly and divide. And then of course you put the drug on board and there's 100% knockout. And so that's kind of, it's good that you can find the DCK, now you can knock it out. And then as we talked before, as you saw the video, we then had efficacy. So the next question of course is safety, right? If you have those elements in place in drug development, the next thing is, well, is it tolerable? So non-clinical first, so looking at our neurology platforms, we were able with our drug, uh, we decreased those activated immune cells that are attacking the body, but had no measurable effects on any of the other uh, cell populations. Now I would add in another mouse study, we administered the COVID vaccine while the mice were on our drug and they mounted a normal immune response to the vaccine, so potentially this is a vaccine-friendly drug that we're developing. But what about the patients, right? So this is from our solid tumors trial. We're seeing the exact same thing. No changes in the normal cell populations. Um, and then as you see there, whether we, uh, we've given 40 milligrams or 480 milligrams, looking at the various cell populations, white blood cells bite infection, red blood cells carry oxygen, Platelets are blood cells that help you with uh, clotting and the like. We've not seen any significant changes within the cell populations, which is very promising, because you can imagine many of the drugs that work in the diseases we're talking about today are immunosuppressive, right? And infection is, is one of the things that, you know, as patients, you know, can, can be quite uh, fearful. Let's take it, though, another step on safety. So this is the, um, this is a, demyelinating disease mouse model that we used where we decided to break things apart a little bit. Let's look on the left part of the slide, which is those activated, abnormally activated, uh, dividing immune cells. And, and then let's look at the good cells, if you will, the normal resting naive cells. And what you see is that our drug is more of a scalpel than a hammer. If we're taking out the bad acting on the left, anywhere from two thirds to, three, uh, to four fifths, while the normal uh, cell populations have remained stable throughout the treatment period of the mice. And I think that's very important because we can take out the cells that cause the diseases of ADM or optic neuritis, but have no effect on those healthy cells that are there that our body uses to fight diseases. Now I told you we have some patients. I'd like to introduce you to the brave, one of the bravest people in the world. This is Stephanie. So Stephanie was the first patient to ever be dosed with a DCK inhibitor. She was 50 years old. Um, she had a very rare uh, tumor in her abdomen. In her own words, she described it as the size of small watermelons. And she had gone through every chemotherapy, cell therapy, uh, some investigational, and was kind of out of options. And so Stephanie elected to be the first patient dosed with a first-in-class uh, first drug. And she had a, a remarkable run, I have to say. Um, you know, she ended up getting her weight back, her hair grew. Uh, she even took um, a trip of a lifetime with her two daughters for three weeks. And in her own words, um, you know, there are even days that I forget that I have cancer, which was really promising. I think Ben said yesterday that the first 50 patients, you know, are more valuable to us as researchers, you know, than perhaps we are to them. I would argue the first patient dosed with a drug that has no clinical history, in many ways it's an act of medical altruism, and I'm, we're in her debt, you know, that she paved the way for the two dozen patients that have since uh, followed her. What are we seeing in those patient populations? 
So safety-wise, no-dose limiting toxicities, it's very well tolerated. It does, as we measure the amount of drug in the blood, it does, um, it has a nice once-a-day profile, a, a good half-life. It's a once-daily uh, pill. Uh, about one in four patients have had um, anti-tumor activity, so that means it's on target. You know, it's taking out the salvage pathway. And that the biomarkers have, have been rather impressive. Uh, we've been able to see that on a liquid biomarker basis as well as on the PET probes with the patients. And so we have the cumulative evidence of the safety and the pharmacologic side of things uh, all in place now uh, for about two dozen patients, and we continue to dose escalate at this time. So what does that mean for the future? What does the future hold? This is always the fun part you know, of conferences like this. So we have a few things going for us. Like I said before, we are submitting our pre-IND package to the FDA for ADM clinical entry. We're looking at the critical ADM patients, so very much like Ashley, who we met in person yesterday and then just saw on the video, uh, pediatrics and adults that you know, require intensive care. And the thing we have going for us quite well is we have a cross-linked IND. We have an open trial, an open package with the FDA. They've already checked our manufacturing. They've, you know, they've, they've looked at quite a few things you know, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, application. Based on the FDA's feedback from the pre-IND, you then switch into an IND submission, uh, which would then allow us to proceed into clinical trials for, um, for these patients. Uh, we will need to raise more capital you know, for those clinical operations, but this would be US-based uh, phase one trial uh, that we would then be activating. And then lastly, in um, 2026 and beyond, we can see ourselves expanding our uh, neuroimmune clinical trial offerings uh, getting into optic neuritis and, and other diseases, and as well as uh, petitioning the FDA for a phase two registrational. So phase two registrationals allow approval of a drug on a phase two package, as opposed to having to go through you know, phase three and beyond. So that's kind of our high level uh, timeline. And then I would just say it's, uh, you know, thank you for, um, for hearing our story. Um, it's, been, um, it's been one, as we say, uh, decades in the making. And it takes a whole lot of effort, as you see. Hopefully that timeline kind of shows the, um, the people, the institutions, the, um, all the things that go into place. If you want to see more of the science, uh, we did make the cover manuscript of immunology. You can scan the QR code and get as much science as you like. Uh, it's about 45 pages. And, um, and we just want to again thank, uh, thank Siegel for uh, kind of being our thought partners all along the way. So thank you. Any questions? Yes. Oh, so Sandy. First, okay. I'm going to say. First, I'm going to say. Oh, sorry. Um, any kind of science that involves ADEM, I'm going to be eternally grateful for because it has been a population that has been unbelievably understudied. So thank you so much for that work. So understudied, if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, there's not a trial. I'm, <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so my, my questions are really, I'm coming from an anthropologist because I don't exist on the molecular level. Sure. Um, my first question is, how would you anticipate the timing on when a person who's having that inflammatory attack and then is diagnosed with ADEM, what would be the timing when you would introduce this medication? And my second question is, how would you design a clinical trial for those people with the other I mean, I don't even know at this stage of the game whether we, we have standard of care for treatment of ADEM mm -hmm. acutely, do we, Ben? We do. It's not approved products, but it is, there is standard of care that's accepted in yeah, the treatment so of Yeah, so how ADEM. would you anticipate how this strategy would work with the other mm -hmm. widely acceptable treatments for ADEM? How sure. would you design that clinical trial? Sure, so the first question is, when would this drug be used? And then the second question is, how would it be used with existing standard of care? 
So for when it would be used, this is the drug that you try to get in as soon as you can. So because it is a very, um, a very quick, what's called a Tmax, so the rapid absorption of the drug you know, in the stomach is usually within about an hour or so, and we start getting some peaks you know, that, then, that then continue. So from a treatment perspective, this is when the ADEM patient is diagnosed, um, especially the critical care patient that's been diagnosed as you know, critical care dependent on the ventilator, uh, all these sorts of things. Now we do have a bit of a debate going on right now between our two potential clinical sites, um, Harvard and Stanford, over how long can you go before you start the drug. Uh, but I believe where we're, where we're going to be landing, uh, Sandy, is if the patient's in the hospital and in critical care, they get the drug, no matter if it's been unrecognized you know, for a day or much long, or longer than that. How would this work in a clinical trial? So part of our submission process to the FDA for pre-IND is actually having a clinical trial synopsis. So this clinical trial will give quite a bit of latitude to the principal investigators to be able to use standard of care. Um, right now, standard of care is steroids are number one. Then it kind of bifurcates a little bit. Right? Was it IVG or IVIG or is it Plex? And then rituximab is usually kind of bringing up the you know, third line, fourth line. So what we would be doing is on top of that, typically in these critical care, you know, these, these, these more severe cases of ADM, many things are used and all things would be permitted with our drug on top. Does that help, Sandy? It does, but the interesting part then would be, sorry, the interesting piece of that would be how would you be able to isolate the impact of this strategy from the other strategies yeah, that are chart being reviews. used. Yeah, yeah, historical. So because there's standards of care for ADM, what you would look at is the historical recovery rates you know, of these ADM patients at the various treating sites compared to those who received our therapy. This would, when you're phase one, you're not um, placebo controlled or anything like that. It's open label. And you would look to see on two measures, you know, one, you know, uh, mortality, but the second, morbidity, you know, so long-term, you know, cognitive or motor, you know, uh, 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 dysfunctions, you know, in this patient population. There are some scoring systems that allow for that. Even in the pediatric side, we found a few that we'll be asking the FDA's opinion on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes, pardon my ignorance, but is the DZK pathway found in other diseases, and could this be extrapolated to other diseases? And the second question you mentioned for pediatric ADEM, are you all looking at getting this approved through the pediatric priority review voucher process and getting approved earlier? Sure. So for starters, any disease that has abnormal cell division and proliferation typically utilizes the DCK pathway, the salvage pathway. So we do have, um, we do have potential in Crohn's. Uh, we actually um, had a patient with Crohn's disease go through the PET probe and it lit up just like you saw the mice with MS. Uh, we also have strong potential in lupus is something else we're seeing. So uh, interestingly, I'm treating a patient with a solid tumor right now who also has myasthenia gravis and a couple of other neuro things going on. So we have to wonder you know, what might be happening, you know, on multiple levels there with this drug. For the priority review voucher uh, for the pediatric side, that is granted after the approval. Um, so right now what this would be is we would involve the, um, the orphan disease division of the FDA plus the neuro division, and we would try for fast track first, and then it goes into breakthrough, and then on approval you would get the pediatric priority review voucher. That's an incentive that the FDA gives to develop drugs for uh, children since typically um, not many people do. So it's one of those things that they try. But we, our, our trial will be open for children and adults, our phase one ADM trial. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, thank you everybody very much.